Hey everybody, welcome to our virtual Bible study. Thank you for tuning in tonight. If you're following our current series on how to study the Bible, tonight, uh, today, is lesson number 10. We'll probably end up having to break it into two parts, which means today this lesson will be the first of two lessons under lesson number 10. So part one and part two are part A and part B. I will mark this one in the heading as lesson 10 part A for how to study the Bible. And I want to talk about what we are going to do in this study in just a moment. Before we do that, I've got to do some standard operating procedure when I invite you to do a couple of things with the service that you're watching this on. So you're either watching on our YouTube channel or you're watching on the Facebook page. So if you're on YouTube, I'd like for you to do a couple of things. Go down below the video and I don't know that it's any different on anybody's computer screen, but there's going to be a red box with white letters that says subscribe unless the color settings are just off on your computer and you've got purple and gold or white with black letters, hit the subscribe button, whatever color it is. And this does a couple of things. Uh, for you, the benefit to you is because it's totally free. Uh, the benefit to you is that you never miss programming for this congregation's publications. The benefit to us is we gain viewership on our videos. And viewership is what helps push those videos up in visibility on YouTube, and we want that to be the case. We're not monetized. We're not making money. We wouldn't, even if we had the chance, we wouldn't make money on it. Uh, our goal is to publish truth, Bible studies that people can access for free, and you can help get that out to more people, to their eyes, essentially to their hands, get it into the hands of the world. Uh, if you'll help us subscribe to the videos, watch the video, give us a thumbs up, and then subscribe. Now, if you're on Facebook, we need you to do two things. One, it's so easy for us to count the number of people engaged in a video if you'll just give us a thumbs up. We can look at that tab and see the number of people that like the video, and we can get a pretty good estimate as to the number of people engaged in this particular study. Uh, the second thing is share the video on your timeline. Now, that's really important because we do not have access to your friends list, right? We are a public page. It, this is being published on a public page. And in order for people to see it, they've got to be invited to it. It has to be shared. And the easiest way for them to see it is for you to share it on your timeline. So please put it on your timeline. Let people see it. And let's let as many people in the world as can see these videos see these videos. And please help us out with that. Uh, if you've been watching for any length of time, more than a couple of seasons, you know that fall is just about my favorite time of the year, and it is a gorgeous fall day today. So I'm on the porch. I think it's just astounding outside today. So here I am, and I hope that you enjoy uh, this weather as much as I. Now, of course, this is going to be archived, and you may be watching this video in retrospect, you know, in hindsight, you may be watching it two years down the road and it may be freezing cold winter or super hot summer outside. That's okay. That's the benefit of archival videos. However, at the time, it's gorgeous outside, so I'm on the porch. Lesson number 10. I, I just think as I'm publishing this video, as we are publishing it, the North Hamilton Church of Christ is doing, as I'm recording it as we're publishing this, I don't know that this could be a more appropriate lesson because a lot of people are misunderstanding some things in the Bible and applying it to situations in the Middle East right now. Uh, there's a huge war taking place right now uh, between the Israelis and the Palestinians right now, between the Jews and the Palestinians. Um, I'm hoping that two years down the road we can look back and say, hey, that's not happening anymore. Do you remember that time? And I'm watching this video. I remember you talking about that. That's what's going on. And tonight, in lesson number 10, today, we're talking about apocalyptic literature. And I don't know that we could have timed it better than it. It wasn't on purpose, 
you know, we don't know unfolding events. We just do what we do, and sometimes it clicks with things, and there are a lot of people taking statements in the Bible that have nothing to do with what's going on right now, and they're abusing it because apocalyptic literature is so easily misunderstood, if that makes sense. So just the timing of this particular lesson ended up being perfect, and I hope it really helps us as Bible students, but I hope it also helps us in the context of, you know, world affairs, things going on. So apocalyptic literature. Now, we've been studying, you know, on how to study the Bible. We've talked about, we've laid some foundations. Uh, we've laid all the groundwork for rules, sentences, how we gather and understand context. And we've talked about some metaphors and figures of speech and ways of talking in Scripture. We've talked about prophecy. We've talked about numbers, how numbers can sometimes be used figuratively, and a number, and just a, a various subjects. Today, we're talking about apocalyptic literature. So, how are we going to approach it? The first thing I would like for us to do is to examine some basic sort of general facts about apocalyptic literature. And maybe in the process, you can kind of see how it might be abused by people who are taking and using it for things that it never meant and does not teach, and does not apply to. Okay, So, general facts about apocalyptic literature, apocalyptic language, because it's, it falls within the category of metaphors. Now, I understand there might be some true literal statements within apocalyptic literature, but a lot of it is very figurative, very metaphoric. So first, first general fact. The word itself, apocalypse, and you hear people say, oh, the apocalypse is coming. They're basing it on this word. The word apocalypse is a transliteration. Now, transliteration means you're just taking, for example, for us here, the Greek word, you're taking the Greek word apocalypsis and you're transliterating it, which means you're just giving equivalent, for us, equivalent English letters. And we're basically saying a Greek word when we say that. Just like when we say baptism. Baptized, baptism is a transliteration of the original term baptizo. And so we're basically saying the Greek word. And the same thing is true of apocalypse. The word itself, apocalypse, apocalypsis in the original, means a laying bare or a making naked. So it's, it's exposing something. That's what apocalypse means. The word itself inherently does not mean the end of the world. That's how people take it. That's what they often mean by the word apocalypse. That's not the, what the word means. The word apocalypse just means exposing something, laying something open, making it available for our sight to lay it bare. It describes, the term does, an uncovering or a disclosure. So apocalypse is making something known that, was, that would be otherwise um, covered. So you're, you're uncovering it. You're disclosing it. Um, the word apocalypsis, as it appears to us, uh, is, tra is translated, uh, or I should say transliterated for us, actually in the Bible. Um, look at, if you have your Bible, and I hope you do, look at Revelation chapter 1. Look at Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. And if you look at verse 1, this, this is actually translation, by the way. Um, it will say in verse 1, the revelation, that's the word apocalypsis, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants, things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. The word revelation there is the word apocalypsis. And it means an uncovering or a disclosing to lay open, to make available the knowledge of something, to lay it bare, to make naked. Now, he's not talking about laying people naked, making them immodest. 
the idea means that something is concealed and you're uncovering the concealment of it. You're, you're, you're not hiding it anymore. That's what the word apocalypse means. It does not mean the end of the world. That's how people take it. That does not, does not mean that, okay? So it means a laying bare. That's the first fact. Here's the second thing. Apocalyptic literature like Revelation, Zechariah, parts of Daniel, a lot of Ezekiel, it is not impossible. It is not um, unattainable information. It's not impossible to understand. It's not impossible to interpret. I know people. I've met them. I've talked to people who say, I never read the book of Revelation because you can't understand that. I've never read the book of Ezekiel because you can't understand that. That's, that's not true. While it may be difficult, I will freely admit the difficulty of it because it's different than other sections of the Bible. If you read off the top of my head, if you read the Sermon on the Mount and you start in Matthew chapter 5 and you start in verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, and you go through and you start with, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those that mourn, blessed are those that, and you go hunger and thirst for righteousness and the persecuted and all the way through the end of the list, that's very easy to understand, very straightforward. If you're reading the book of James and James says, um, control your tongue, you know, or have faith in chapter 2. That's very easy to understand. It is a lot more difficult to understand the language in Revelation or the language in Ezekiel. It's a lot more difficult. It's not impossible. Okay, so it's not impossible to understand. Uh, I would like to draw your attention to the book of Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 3. And I would like to read verse, I'll just read verse 16. I don't want to break it away from its context, but I think we could understand it without going too much in the context. Verse 16, as also in all his epistles, now he's talking about Paul, if you get that from verse 15, Paul, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do the rest of the scriptures. And by the way, isn't it interesting that, he's, that Peter actually says in this passage that sometimes the more difficult parts of scripture people abuse for their own purposes. And people do that with Revelation, Ezekiel, Daniel, Zechariah, other parts of the Bible that have apocalyptic language. It is not difficult. I should say it's not impossible to understand apocalyptic literature, though it may be more difficult. Truth can be known. In fact... In Revelation chapter 1, if you'll go back to Revelation chapter 1, listen to verse 3. Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Now he's writing to the churches, seven, seven of them in Asia Minor. And in verse 3 he said, Blessed is he who reads, looking with my eyes, taking that information into my head, my intellect processing the information, my will making a decision what to do with it, you can do the same thing. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy. So they're understanding what they're reading and keep those things which are written for the time is near. Okay, so when you read, you can understand. Revelation chapter 1 verse 3, it is not impossible to understand the book of Revelation. It is not impossible to understand Ezekiel. It is not impossible to understand the second half of, of Daniel, really from chapter 7 on. It's not impossible to understand Zechariah. Not impossible. Difficult? Yeah, a little bit more than, say, the Sermon on the Mount, but not impossible. Number three, this is a very distinguishable type of literature. That's a third general fact. It's very different, right? That's part of what makes it a little bit more difficult, but it's very distinguishable. You, you know when you're reading apocalyptic language and when you're not reading it. Books like Ezekiel and Daniel, Zechariah, Revelation for sure, they're known for being written in this style. They're just written in a really different style. Now, the first half of Daniel, I'll say, is very historical, the way it's written, sort of narrative, very historical. And then the second half is very apocalyptic, very prophetic in what, the visions that he's having. Um, even books that are not entirely apocalyptically styled, right? You have some of those. Uh, that language can be found in books, and it's very distinguishable. You just know when you're reading it because it's, it's just very, very distinguishable literature. Uh, certain parts of the book of Joel are that way, chapter 2 especially. 
Amos, Isaiah has some in it, Jeremiah. Um, there's, a, there's a whole section of Matthew chapter 24 that's written that way. I'm going to get my spider friend off of the computer screen. Uh, Matthew 24, down to about verse 35, is very apocalyptically styled. Doesn't mean the end of the world. There's a context to that. He's actually talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Mark 13 is the same way. Um, John chapter 2 has a little section in it. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 has a small section in it. So you can find it in books that aren't entirely apocalyptic. And you just know when you're reading it because it's very distinguishable by, by its feature of very highly figurative language. So that's the third characteristic of it. All right? Knowing these characteristics actually really helps us to understand it. So that's why we're spending a little bit of extra time on the characteristics of it. Here's characteristic number four, or general fact number four. I should say general facts. Number four, prophetic writings tend to emphasize um, sometimes very distant, um, which is interesting because the way people take apocalyptic language is they often look at books that are dealing with unfolding events in the, in the reader's eyes and they apply them very far distantly. Prophetic works tend to, they tend to, if, they, if they're prophesying something, they look far distantly into the future, hundreds, even sometimes in the Old Testament, even millennia into the future, whereas apocalyptic literature tends to emphasize um, very near events. So there's, there's often a contrast between the two. The book of Revelation is largely talking about events that were happening that the seven churches of Asia were watching unfold. And even those events that were in the future were in the very, very near future. Not, not our time, not 2023, but in the first century A.D. And the same was true. Uh, Daniel was largely talking about uh, the unfolding of world superpowers leading to the time of Jesus. So that's already passed for us. And just uh, there's a big difference between the two of those. So general facts is that prophetic works, true prophetic works, um, not, that it, not that there can't be prophecy in apocalyptic language, but that a book that we would normally consider a book of prophecy like, um, you know, uh, Isaiah, right, or Jeremiah uh, tend to have very far forward-looking prophecies, and apocalyptic literature is, is very, it tends to be very limited toward the time of the reader. So there's a contrast between the two of those. And then the final, the fifth fact is this. Apocalyptic books may contain a variety of styles. So in, for example, in Revelation, you could have uh, you could have just really standard salutations mixed in with apocalyptic language, and you could have uh, sections of books that are apocalyptic that all of a sudden go just like historical narratives, and they just sort of become running commentaries on what was happening in history, and then they pull back and do that apocalyptically styled, highly figurative language. Um, there's just different styles. So let me illustrate this, if I can, for us. Revelation chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1, and in chapter 1, you can see different styles sort of blend together to complete this book. So chapter 1, uh, chapter 1, uh, he says, The revelation, verse 1, of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his servants things which must shortly take place, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John. All right, so listen to the style of that, verses, verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and keep the things that are written in the book for the time is near. That sounds very much like a beatitude, right? So the language shifts and all of a sudden the style is very much like something you would read in Matthew chapter 5, chapter 5, 6, and 7. And in chapter 1, verse 1, it's very different. And then listen to verse 11 saying, I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book. Do you know what the word book is there? It's the word epistle. Write in an epistle and send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Th uh, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So it sounds like very much like it's written in the form of a letter right there. There's all kinds of different styles. You're not limited to one specific style inside a an apocalyptic book. And when I say an apocalyptic book, I mean that's predominantly like Revelation, predominantly a book of 
apocalyptic literature. Uh, not like the Gospel of John that may have a segment in it or uh, 2 Thessalonians that's a, that is a, it's an epistle of Paul, but it has parts of it that are very apocalyptically styled. All right, so those are just general facts, and I hope maybe in that we've clarified something, especially about the meaning of the word apocalypse. It does not mean the end of the world. That's not what it means. It just means it's uncovering something, and then it's up to us to find out what God uncovered for us in Scripture. So here's the second part. Now I want to talk about characteristics. I'm, I said that word, and I threw it out there. I, I probably should have saved that word until now because I really do want to deal with what I would consider characteristics of apocalyptic language. You know, we said you can find it anywhere in the Bible. So what are some characteristics of apocalyptic language? Now, based on what I'm looking at for time, this is the, this is the point that I'm going to divide in half before we start next week or the next lesson looking at rules for interpreting apocalyptic language. And I've got, you know, a few rules that might help us uh, as we go through and study this. Now, obviously, I was talking to someone and they said, uh, the first characteristic should be that you tell people that it's part of the Bible. Well, yeah, of course it's part of the Bible. It's obviously part of inspired literature. It's part of the inspired record. It's of divine origin. Uh, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, we read it several times now. He goes, you know, this is the revelation uh, from Jesus Christ to John. So there's a statement of inspiration in that passage. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, uh, Peter's point in that passage by, by inspiration is that there's never been a time when anything was submitted as part of the divine record, as part of the Bible, right? So we're reading scripture and Peter's statement is there's never been a single ounce of this that was not directly and superintended by God. People just not, they did not write letters, and then this is another misconception, right? They did not write a letter and say, God, do you think this is good enough for the Bible? And God, sort of taken by surprise, said, well, let me read it and see if it's okay for Scripture. God guided the revelation of this. Now, did he use the unique personalities of the people? Sure, you see their personalities are reflected. But, but God was not an editor of the Bible. He's the writer of the Bible. And so every word in this book, 2 Timothy 3.16, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, is put there by God. Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, and other passages like it, Daniel made very clear these statements, these visions come from God. So, obviously all... All of it is of divine origin, this apocalyptic literature. Now, I will say, the way in which apocalyptic literature or these visions within apocalyptic literature are received can be very unique. And when you read Revelation, when you read Daniel, Jeremiah, and other places where these, Ezekiel, especially, Ezekiel, uh, you ought to look at the postures that he was in to receive Revelation and to demonstrate Revelation, to reveal it to others. So it can, it can be revealed in very unique uh, supernatural means uh, to teach lessons. Uh, there's even a part of Isaiah that's very much like that. Isaiah 6 is very much where, you know, he gets the, the hot coal and puts it on his tongue. And, um, that's very apocalyptically styled in the way it's styled right there. Uh, Revelation 4, John is sort of carried into the throne room of God. He sees the throne of God. Very unique posture that he was in in that. So what are some characteristics of this language? Well, here's the first one. The most observable characteristic, and this is almost a dead giveaway that you're looking at apocalyptic literature, right? I don't mean just like a metaphor. I mean it is saturated with symbols. And just about any time you're reading scripture and you find a spot in scripture or a book that is saturated with symbols, that's usually apocalyptically styled language. Um, they were often used, God used these, this style of writing, for actually concealing messages from enemies to protect the book or the message from outside sources. Uh, sometimes the symbols actually transcended the physical realm and they portrayed heavenly scenes. And a person who was not uh, imbued with spiritual gifts, especially in first century, we've probably never been able to discern that. But it was given on purpose to try to hide the message from people who would have corrupted the message 
And especially, like, for example, Revelation, you know, uh, Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, John said, I, I was on the Isle of Patmos when I did this. That's a prison island. He's a prisoner. Now, his letters would have been read. Can you imagine if he's detailing events that are unfolding in the Roman Empire? They would have thought, how do you know this? Uh, you're going to be put to death because you know this information. So the message was concealed. It was encoded. And people with spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 9 through 11, would have been able to have the gift of interpretation. They would have had that ability. Back in the first century, they would have had that. Um, so there's the use of symbols. You almost always know. The, the, the very first chapter of Ezekiel, when you open it up, it's just Boom, it's in your face, and you're like, wow, I'm reading an apocalyptically styled book. You can be re reading Zechariah, and you start reading Zechariah, and then all of a sudden, boom, it just throws it in your face, and you're like, ooh, the language changed. It's apocalyptically styled language. And from the very beginning of Revelation, you know, Revelation 1 1 says, he sent and signified it, the word there, sign, he signified it by, uh, to John. So these are symbols that you're going to see in the book. This is an apocalyptically styled book, which means the book is uncovering something. Let's check our time. All right, maybe one more point. Here's the second characteristic. In apocalyptic literature, there is always some kind of controversy between good and evil. It's, it's always set in opposition to each other. There's this battle. It's, it's always depicted. Evil versus good. Good versus evil. And uh, the work... What, whatever it is, Revelation, Ezekiel, Daniel, whatever the work is, whatever the book is, the writing is, it's always going to demonstrate in the context of that contest of evil versus good, it's always going to demonstrate to explain the power of God triumphing over evil and that God's people are victorious. Every one of those books, that's what Ezekiel is about. That's what the last half of Daniel is about. It's what Revelation is about. It's, I mean, it's what... Zechariah is about. It's about how God wins. It's always that way. That is, a, that is a dominant characteristic, a dominant feature of apocalyptically styled language. Uh, let's check our time. Okay, one more. I'll do one more. This is number three. And I'll have to remember where I'm at for part two, right, part B. The third characteristic of apocalyptically styled language is that, and if you've read it, you know it, scenes change very abruptly in apocalyptically styled language. One moment the scene can be very dark and it can talk about danger and then the, in the very, just a flash of an eye in the next scene, it's very uh, light and victorious and there's refuge and there's safety and the scene will shift from just back and forth. That is a, that is a dead giveaway that you're dealing with apocalyptic styled language, right? When you're dealing with uh, this type of literature that you see in the books that we've mentioned several times already. All right, so I'm going to put a peg in it here. I've, I'm going to come back. I've got about three more characteristics, and then uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, about nine, maybe nine rules that will help us read and be able to understand apocalyptic language. It's not impossible. I promise you could pick up Revelation today and read it, with a couple of things in mind, you could know exactly what he's talking about if you get a couple of things right from the beginning. Okay? I'm excited about this. I love apocalyptically styled language. I just love it. I love challenges uh, in Scripture. I love where there's a little bit more difficult, and then when you figure it out, it's just, well, oh, it makes you so excited about the Scriptures. And, of course, we're excited about it always anyway. We just love this study about how to study the Bible. I hope you're loving it too. All right. Next lesson, Part B, we'll finish it up. And I hope you'll come back and you'll, I hope you'll share the video. I hope you'll do that. And I hope you, I, I know in the context in which I'm giving this, the time context, it's fall weather. I hope you're enjoying this beautiful fall weather. And uh, even if you're watching this after the fact and it's blistering cold outside and there's snow falling, I hope you look around me right now and go, I remember when it was that beautiful weather. I'm just enjoying it. Hey, I love you very much. I really do. And you encourage me. I hope I encourage you. But God loves you even more than I do, and I'm very thankful for that, and I hope you are too, and I hope that we'll use that motivation to in turn submit to the will of God and serve Him like He wants to be served according to Scripture. And if I can help you do that, please let me know. I'd love to study and talk with you. love to talk with you. I won't be mean. I'll even buy you a cup of coffee if you want to sit down and have a cup of coffee. 
Um, I'll do it, I promise. Hey, let's get together and study. Until then, we'll come back, Lesson 10B. I'll see you next time. Have a great week, guys. Thank you.